Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thank you for inviting me to this timely event talking about the environmental threats and climate threats to our security in times of Russian aggression towards Ukraine. First of all, let me elaborate my standpoint on why Mr. Putin's regime is actually attacking Ukraine. First of all, it's a well-performing democracy. It's a well-performing economical performance of the country. It's an arising free society that poses a direct provocation to Mr. Putin's regime in Russia. But the second main reason I see in the European Green Deal, as Russia is dependent on their budget on approximately 60% exported raw material goods like oil, gas, and minerals, the survival of Mr. Putin's regime is directly linked to these incomes of raw materials and especially fossil fuels. And as the European Union is the by far biggest and best customer of Russian fossil fuels, this is posing a direct threat to Mr. Putin's regime. Because if the European Union is making it true to become independent from fossil fuel imports, this would pose a serious threat to Mr. Putin's regime. But you have invited me to talk about a bit another angle today. I had the honor of being the rapporteur of an own initiative report in the European Parliament in uh, the light of the committee SEDE, so the Security and Defense Committee, which is a subcommittee of the Foreign Policy Committee. And I was chairing this process with uh, my co-shadow rapporteurs to unite the different strains of work on climate as, a, climate as a security risk that have been present in different institutions of the European Commission and the European institutions, but also NATO before. In the new strategic compass, the European Commission has already uptaken uh, the climate crisis as a serious security threat to our societies. After this summer, I think it's more than clear how this security threat looks for us directly in the European Union. But especially in our neighborhood, global warming and climate crisis is a main driver of insecurity. In the Maghreb region, so Northern Africa, land use conflicts and conflicts on resources are one of the main drivers of political violence, political turmoils, or in cases of the Sahel zone or south of the Sahel zone, they are drivers of a polarization and radicalization of parts of society. Let's take Nigeria as an example. Originally, this conflict was a conflict on land use. There were the nomads and uh, animal uh, husbandry uh, farmers from the north. Yes, they were Muslims. And there were the farmers, the crop farmers, further in the south. And they were more or less Christians. But the original conflict was one on land use because global warming was driving the hurdle um, um, hurdle uh, husbandry, animal husbandry tribes further to the south and this caused conflicts, which was then uploaded with a lot of religious disputes. And you see, this is just one example how climate crisis is driving conflicts around the world. And as we are having missions in some of these countries, like Mali, we need to acknowledge that global warming and climate crisis in these regions is one of the main drivers of insecurity. So the report talks a lot about prevention of conflicts, of early estimation where conflicts could arise or explode so we can be prepared to prevent conflicts or in case we are too late to prevent them, at least to be there in time to secure civilian population from being affected. But also we have to look into the actual contributions our own military services are giving to the global warming and climate crisis. Our own military services are one of the biggest polluters. As far as I know, they are our biggest public polluter. There's no concrete numbers available for most of the countries because they are treated as a kind of military secret. But in fact, also our military services have to contribute their share to a CO2 neutral society. Ursula von der Leyen made it very clear also the military services have to contribute a reduction of 30% of the 
of CO2 emissions. And now many of you may think, well, mm, we're not going to go to war with bicycles. Exactly not. That's not what we're talking about. If you look at the emissions in the military services, you see that more than half of the emissions are only going to procurement, to heating and to cooling. So it's about the houses we're using. It's about the emissions uh, and, and the way we are there using heating and cooling or how we are actually feeding and procuring our troops on the ground. And there we have a lot of room to improve. We have a lot of room through insulation and so on. But the second question is, can we get rid of at least parts of the fossil fuel we use? Maybe solar energy is a solution, and some may laugh now, but talk to the generals. I had a conversation with a general leading a mission in Mali, and he clearly pointed out one of the biggest strategic vulnerab vulnerabilities of our troops there was the, the fuel provision. They, even had to bring in fuel with a helicopter while the helicopter was using half of the amount of the fuel that it was transporting. So the general election surprised me with proposing that we could even electrify tanks. Because in the case of a tank, the weight of the battery wouldn't make a big difference. But at least having some electric vehicles out there that can be fueled with our own solar power plants that we install. But it's also about what we leave behind after our troops leave. Do we leave behind piles of rubbish, waste? Do we leave behind, or do we leave behind well-functioning, drilled, freshly drilled wells that are, can be used by civilian population? Do we leave behind big empty tanks, or do we leave behind some solar power installations for locals? And last but by far not least, this report is talking a lot about cooperation with local population, about interacting, especially with the female population that is more likely to be interested in peace building and in the, let's say, common good, which is also a relatively new experience, also our generals share. And how can we invest to prevent conflicts or to stabilize peace, to keep peace, in the light of environmental destructions that are very often and most of the time linked to climate crisis. So climate crisis is pausing, I would say, the main security risk in long term, even in times of Russian invasion of Ukraine, which is for sure now our short term priority. So the report was voted in the European Parliament with a big majority. It was a bit, let's say, overshadowed by the invasion of Putin into Ukraine. But we had a very constructive work in bringing together all these strings of already existing work and with this complementing our efforts to seriously take global warming and climate change into account when it comes to securing the security of our populations and our future citizens. Thank you very much for your invitation and I wish you all the best for the further event.